Well, thank you. Uh, it is an honour to be here at Queen's this evening, uh, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. And thank you, Kieran, for those kind words of introduction. It's a bit of a challenge for me tonight because when I took time to consider what I might say here this evening, as I enter my last two months as a police officer, um, it wasn't straightforward. I felt almost at a loss, overwhelmed as to how I could reflect the myriad of thoughts, emotions and experiences in a way that might actually help signpost the next steps for policing, for peace building, uh, for our communities. So forgive me if I sound like I'm rambling, but there's just so much in here and I'm trying to get out in a sort of a structured way. But it was 1985 um, when I started in policing. A very different time to where we are now. I became a police officer because I genuinely, this might sound twee, but I genuinely wanted to make a difference. But I very quickly realized uh, that my desire was hampered by many factors, including politics, perceptions, prejudice, and all of that in the context of the ongoing conflict that was raging pretty heavy still in the mid-80s. And those obstacles were all pervasive. For me, at an individual level, in my assessment, they certainly were impacting negatively on the organisation that I had joined and impacting negatively in society in the various communities that make up this place. So I suppose to be positive and optimistic as I stand here over 30 years later as Chief Constable, brackets, I never thought I would be doing that or saying that as Chief Constable, but I am and it's been a, it's been a great journey and an exhilarating one. But I stand here and I think, and hopefully you'd agree with me, uh, even if you disagree with other elements of what I'm going to say tonight, that the situation has been significantly transformed and for the better. Both policing and the community and the communities have been on a remarkable journey. And has that journey been completed? Well, of course it hasn't. I think it's clear to all that it's far from complete. But my experiences as a police officer on that journey have been both painful and pleasant. At times I've felt part of progress. At other times, I have felt like we, I, have been stuck, even pulled or pulling backwards. Overwhelmingly, however, I feel a great sense of pride in what policing and communities have achieved together. We have invested so much and we have come so far, but we would be foolhardy to think that more change is not needed. So this evening, I want to add just my thoughts on our journey, where we've been to get to this point, and what our experiences might mean for the future. As in all transformational processes, there will be things that worked and we can be pleased about, we can even be proud of, but there will also be things that have not turned out quite how we expected. And there will be other things that simply need revisited or restarted. Since 2001, the transformation and placing has been scrutinized closely by local, national, international observers and accountability regimes. In recent years, a report to the United Nations by one of their special rapporteurs, Pablo de Creef, observed that of all the different elements of the peace process in Northern Ireland, the area in which the most progress has been achieved is the transformation of placing. Now, I have served sort of half of, my, um, half of my police service in the RUC and the other half in PSNI with three years out when I was in the RUC for a dalliance into England, which was lovely, and in the PSNI three years out for a dalliance into Scotland. So, but during that journey and actually taking time out to look from afar and then to come back has enabled me, I think, to have a unique to me experience 
our observation of what transformation has actually undergone in policing, especially when I see it and compare it with uh, other neighbouring jurisdictions. As an RUC officer, my desire was to keep people safe, and it was no less in the RUC than in the PSNI, having that simple values-based purpose to keep people safe. But I am... I believe the vast majority of colleagues that I have served with in both organisations recognised that policing had to change if we were to gain support across all of our communities. The patent change process was about much more than a change in name or uniform. Important though that was in terms of symbols, but it was also about changes in structures and processes and most importantly it was about changes in culture and emotion. That was the difficult stuff. That is the difficult stuff. Cultural transformation does not happen immediately. It takes time, it takes courage and resilience. A key success of the transformation process, I think, has been the way in which accountability and human rights have been built into the foundations, into the DNA of the Police Service of Northern Ireland. I believe modifying for the better how policing thinks, what makes it tick and how it acts. In addition to this, the mechanisms provided by the Northern Ireland Policing Board and the Office of the Police Ombudsman have been essential to building trust and confidence in policing. I was deeply frustrated during the past two years uh, when the policing board was not constituted due to the collapse of the Stormont institutions. I advocated strongly for the return of the board and I welcomed its reconstitution at the end of last year and I do appreciate the attendance tonight of my chair Anne Conley. So what I would be the first to say that the policing journey is not yet complete. I can also say with confidence that policing has undergone a remarkable transformation and for the most part, for the better. Over the last 10 years, we have overseen an almost 10% reduction in crime. That's despite over £150 million being taken out of the police budget in common with other public services due to austerity. That's 150 million just in my tenure in the last five years. In addition, independent surveys, not commissioned, not conducted by the police service, but independently through the DOJ, through the policing board, through others, are showing that uh, confidence in policing across the board continues to rise and is currently sitting at 86%. Now, I know, and I'll be happy to respond to it in questions, that there will be pockets, there will be corners of communities, there will be neighbourhoods where we have a massive job of work to do and the confidence levels would not feel like 86% in those communities. But I'm talking across the piece on statistically reliable research and survey conducted independently of us, we're sitting at 86% with £150 million out of the budget and a 10% reduction in crime. And in addition to that, uh, and I, we have a way to go on this as well, but we are more diverse and more representative than we have ever been, but still a huge way to go. And also complaints against the police at their lowest level in our history. So policing is, in my view, and I would say this, wouldn't I, but I believe it's a noble profession. It's also a difficult one. Powers to stop people on the street, to search them, to remove a fellow citizen's liberty from them are powers that no police officer should ever take lightly. At times, it's uncomfortable. The statutory duties placed upon us require us to take difficult and unpopular decisions. But we don't actually have a choice of simply ignoring an issue because it's too unpleasant too difficult, will result in bad publicity, will result in a hard time at the policing board. No, we must go where the evidence takes us. We must act with integrity. In doing so, it's right and proper that the checks and balances are in place so that we are held to account for our actions through the courts, 
through the policing board uh, and through the police ombudsman. Furthermore, it's not just accountability that gives confidence. It's actually good quality policing. Good policing with communities. Policing with communities builds confidence, credibility and legitimacy. Policing with the community, you see, buys us the license to operate in challenging and difficult circumstances. So when we do that stuff that is unpopular, that is unpleasant, that doesn't quite feel right, but it's going where the evidence takes us, if we have done community policing well, it gives us the credibility, it gives us the license to operate in those challenging circumstances. At the last public meeting of the policing board, my senior team and I had to answer questions on a broad range of policing challenges that actually matter to our communities. These included, amongst other issues, the police investigation and response, the initial response into the horrific tragedy at the Greenville Hotel in Kickstown. We were getting challenged about our response to not being able to catch these ATM thieves. The caseload of our legacy investigations branch, the disclosure machinery that we had to service civil litigation, legacy inquests, criminal investigations, and all the rest of it. And on top of that, the management of the police budget and questions about why overtime was so high. I have always felt what I would describe as a healthy sense of nervousness as I go to the policing board. It can be challenging, but the ability to be able to have a discussion, a meaningful discussion about policing in such an open and transparent arena can only be beneficial for the organisation that I lead. There is no doubt in my mind that whilst I hold operational responsibility for policing, the board on behalf of the community not only holds me to account, important though that is, but also informs, advises, challenges and contributes to policing decisions in a real and meaningful way. And if, as cops, you can get over yourself, that is a really healthy source of challenge and of enablement around good decision making. It therefore seems incredible to me that for two of the five years of my tenure as chief, I didn't have a formally constituted policing board. Although with what was left with the chair and the independents and the officials, we continued to act as if it was there. But actually, that was on the basis of goodwill and determination on all of our parts. That an institution so critical to policing could be so vulnerable to political turmoil is one aspect of our journey I think that needs re-examined afresh. That accountability deficit should never be brought back to bear on policing when the politics collapses. So far from being an impediment, I believe accountability is an enabler of good, effective policing, even though at times it's extremely uncomfortable. Policing in itself is a human endeavour, and as in every human endeavour, mistakes and failings are inevitable. When they occur, the only way to, that we will retain the public's trust is if we're ready to acknowledge our shortcomings and to learn the lessons from the failings. I think PSNI has demonstrated our readiness, our willingness to do so through the robust accountability mechanisms of the policing board and the police ombudsman and the multiplicity of other inspection agencies who examine our actions, as well as, for the most part, a willingness to be accountable to communities through the media and through local engagement. There is, however, sometimes I think a need for reflection and recalibration on accountability. There's a balance to strike between good and effective accountability and a level of irresponsible, reactive and ill-informed commentary that can become corrosive and destabilizing. I'm not being defensive, but in my view at times that balance has been lost and the journey that policing and society have been on have suffered as a result. 
Supporting good, effective accountability and supporting the delivery, the delivery of effective policing comes with a level of responsibility that sometimes has been lacking. Across the political spectrum, those who, sh who should bear responsibility for supporting further progress have sometimes defaulted to the blame game. They have retreated into their respective political bunkers when it suits them, finding it easier to blame the police without taking any responsibility for the context in which their police service is being asked to operate. Legacy is a clear example of this. Legacy has been a challenge on which Patton's new beginning to policing has continued to stall. The impact on public confidence is immeasurable. In the first speech, the first uh, speech that I gave as Chief Constable, I warned that policing and indeed our peace process risked being dragged backwards unless a societal political resolution was found to dealing with the past. Throughout my tenure, I have explained publicly and privately, time and time again, to anybody that will listen, the PSNI is neither resourced nor equipped to deal with the past. So you should not be surprised when we drop the ball. And that's not an excuse or defensiveness. It's the reality that we have warned of. I welcome the proposals made in the Stormont House Agreement and offer to give all of the PSNI legacy data to the proposed Independent Historical Investigations Unit, allowing us to concentrate on keeping people safe today and into the future. I'm now in my final two months as a police officer, and there is still little sign of progress. I therefore find it disappointing that politicians from all parties give me tea and sympathy in private on this matter, but in public talk of our failures in dealing with legacy and how this has created things like rock bottom confidence in policing or partisan policing by only pursuing state actors rather than the terrorists who inflicted the most pain. That's not effective accountability. That's point scoring. That's shifting the blame. What policing needs on this issue is political honesty and political leadership to bring about solutions to fix the problem. Families need that honesty and that leadership too. I think it's a damning indictment that in the ongoing political vacuum, members of grieving families are passing away without any resolution, without justice and without answers. Another area for our transformation that needs renewed and constructive accountability is community representativeness within the police service. For a police service anywhere to have the confidence of the community, it must be representative of that community. While the police service today is much more representative of the community than the one I joined in 1985, but like all other police services, we still have lots of work to do in this regard. We remain underrepresented among a number of groups, including young people, women, members of the Catholic Nationalist Republican community, members of loyalist working class areas, and people living west of the ban. Worryingly, our current forecasting shows that if recruitment continues as it is, and retirements continue as they are, our overall Catholic representation will decrease. I have expressed concern about this publicly and have asked for a rational, informed public discussion on the issue, ideally via our policing board. But our last recruitment campaign was overshadowed by a political debate and point scoring on the virtues, the advantages, the disadvantages of 50-50 recruitment. Again, I do not believe that such acrimonious debate provides effective accountability that supports real progress for all of us. It is my view that political point scoring occurs at the, at the expense of policing and our peace process. PSNI will continue, of course, to challenge 
itself as to what more we can do to improve representativeness, including options like direct entry into various levels of the organisation and various specialisms, apprenticeships and secondments, different ways of doing things. But the fact remains that the police service cannot do this in isolation. The bigger and more sustainable requirement is political and societal change. So bear with me, but I want to spend a few moments just talking about recent events and the scourge of paramilitarism and violent dissident republican activity and what we can perhaps see in that as we look to the future and to try to build a more positive uh, process. So the terrible events of the last few weeks expose an important stage in our collective ongoing journey. Thursday night, the 18th of April, uh, bullets meant for police officers claimed the life of Lyra McKee, a young woman who championed inclusivity, murdered by young men who had been lost in the margins of our new beginning. Her killers are not just the young man who fired the gun and his accomplice who lifted the casings. Her killers are also those who supplied the gun and orchestrated the journey of those young men to the moment in which Lyra was murdered. In January this year, the same group were responsible for a car bomb that exploded outside the courthouse in Derry. A group of young people had walked past the car just minutes before. What if the bomb had exploded at that moment when those kids were walking past? Lyra's murder makes that what if question all the more real. Those who continue to believe in the use of violence do so in acceptance of the fact that they are risking the lives of their own communities. Their intended target may be police officers or prison officers, but their very actions place communities at risk. They do not care. In fact, they seem to embrace it as an expense of their cause. Among the consequences of each and every attack is the reality that a member of their own community could be killed or injured. Lyra's family, partner and friends are now living with that reality. Hiding behind masks and clandestine media interviews, those that carry out these attacks show cardus in a way that they, in the way they feel to make themselves accountable to their community. They have made it abundantly clear that the violence will continue despite their own admission that it is little community support. What if, what if instead of Lyra, the bullet had hit a police officer? For the very small number of people who think that such an outcome would have been okay, let me tell you a little bit about the police officers that were on the ground standing beside Lyra that night that administered first aid that put her into a police vehicle that confided her to hospital hoping that she would survive. survive. They, like Lyra, have family, partners and friends that love them, that care for them. They are also sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, some of them mums and dads. Some of them grew up in the city, are citizens of the city and care for it. Lyra chose the noble profession of journalism and had excelled in her short life, contributing hugely to our community with her thought-provoking words and her incisive analysis. The police officers in Cregan on the night she was murdered had chosen the profession of policing. Their individual contributions to the community are less well known. One of the officers there, standing in the vicinity, who administered first aid, who took her to hospital, was also the first officer on the scene of the bomb outside the courthouse in January. Without a thought for his own safety, he began to evacuate people from the area. From the area. Windows exploded around him when the bomb exploded. 
Another of the officers there that night had saved the life of a man that day who was involved in a car crash in the city. Two others had helped save a life of a suicidal individual at the foil bridge that day. Earlier this year, a number of officers who were there prevented serious harm when they searched and recovered guns in the city to help keep the city safe. Guns and blades at a graveyard in Park, just outside of Derry, while others have been involved in taking at least £200,000 worth of drugs off the streets. These are just a tiny snapshot of the many individual unknown stories of how police officers serve our community, police with the community, every day and every night. Since Lyra's murder, many powerful gestures have been made by a community that is tired of violence. Many powerful words have been spoken or written. Challenges have rightly been led at the feet of our political leaders, most recently and eloquently, of course, by Father Martin McGill, McGill at, uh, speaking at Lyra's funeral service. Those challenges have had resounding support across the community. And I believe, being the optimism, being the optimist that I am, that those challenges have been heard. Today, of course, was the first day of cross-party talks. What action will unfold from that? We need to wait and see. But there must be no underestimation that a resolution to the outstanding issues is badly, badly needed. Before, long before Lyra was murdered, there was a sense that our peace process was stalling. Certainly the political process was stalling. In cold police statistical terms, there have been 150 security related deaths since in the 21 years since the peace agreement. But behind each statistic is the devastation, grief and pain of family and friends. There have been many more paramilitary style assaults or punishment beatings, whatever label you want to attach to them. Each one leaving not just broken bodies of victims, but the shattered minds and hearts and mental health problems of people all around them. Despite all the progress that we have made, paramilitaries still seek to exert coercive control on our communities, peddling a fantasy that they exist to protect or defend the community. These groups are mostly driven by their own self-interest. The Fresh Start Agreement was an opportunity to change all that. The agreement was a clear recognition that bringing an end to paramilitarism would never be achieved by policing working in isolation. That was old thinking. Through the Paramilitary Crime Task Force, of course, there is a role for the police service and the PSNI is working hard to deliver on our responsibilities within the Fresh Start Action Plan or the Tackling Paramilitaries Action Plan as it no longer feels much like a fresh start. But we need others to do the same. And we need a functioning executive, uh, a functioning political leadership to help support and drive that delivery. A restored executive would have the opportunity, and I believe the community support, to take brave steps to reset our transformation agenda. Not just for policing, but for the wider uh, peace process. I believe the learning we have gained over the last 20 years should allow us to be more ambitious about what we can achieve. The same communities who suffer from the intimidation, abuse and serious harm caused by paramilitaries and organised crime are also vulnerable to social deprivation, to isolation, uh, they suffer higher levels of drug and alcohol addiction, as well as educational underattainment. These communities are crying out for good, effective community policing, and they should remain a priority for the police service in the future, despite the ongoing serious uh, budgetary constraints. But it's not just policing that these communities want. They want the support from a more holistic and joined up public services, including health and education and 
job opportunities, uh, housing, infrastructure, as well as the crime and community safety issues. Before the political collapse had stormed, there were some glimmers of light, of hope for us optimists that are still around. That light shone out of the draft programme for government, which for the first time in Northern Ireland brought forward the vision of real and effective partnership, working across public services to provide support to the most vulnerable in our communities and to deliver the best services in the most efficient way. We need the political leadership that brought that thinking to bear to get re-energised and re-engaged. Transformation is a constant aspect of life. Some aspects of transformational uh, change can be visible and powerfully felt, while other aspects can be slow and quiet and in our busy world almost happen unnoticed. Transformation can bring positive progress, but equally it can have negative impacts. Indeed, the same transformation can be experienced from one person to the next, from one community to the next, in very different ways. All of these aspects of transformation have been part of our journey to date. I said at the outset that the journey of policing and our community is not yet complete. Of course it's not. And the fact is it never will be complete because peace and progress requires constant nurturing and investment. Over the past 20 years, as a community, and as a police service, we have invested so much. It will be the failure of our generation if we do not reinvigorate our efforts, re-energize our efforts, and invite the next generation to continue the transformation. We have overcome far greater challenges in the past. I know we can do the same again in the future. Communities and politicians working together with police have shown great leadership and taken great risks to bring peace. Do you remember the hope when the peace agreement was reached in 1998? Do you remember the optimism, the pragmatism, the compromise, to use a dirty word in some circles, the compromise from political leadership that restored the power sharing executive 12 years ago tomorrow on the 8th of May? Uh, 2007. The politicians going into the current talks should reflect carefully, they should challenge themselves on the leadership and the work of their political predecessors over the past 21 years. I'm going to finish now and I want to conclude by using the oft quoted wise and eloquent words of Seamus Heaney in The Cure of Troy. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that a, current, that a further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. Thank you very much.